I got out of the army. I haven't spoken to my mom for five years. I have a new phone. She doesn't know my phone number. It's two o'clock in the morning. And I'm sitting there and I say, I said, God, I don't believe you exist. But if you do, I want to hear my mom's voice right now. When I tell you 30 seconds later, my phone rang with a block number. I was so scared to answer the phone. And I answered the phone and it's her crying. I said, why are you crying? And I'm crying. She says, because God told me you were in pain. I had to call you. I'm like, what? And I'm just like, I can't even talk. So what's going on? I can't even, I can't even tell her what I'm experiencing. Because it wasn't about her at that time. I was I'm like, what the hell is going on here? This could be real. Like, is there really a higher power? This is a question that has plagued mankind for millennia. The prophets depended on God's involvement. Deists were dependent on God's lack of involvement. And atheists depended on the notion that there was no God. Yet if there is no God, or if he randomly comes and goes, how do we account for all those mysterious moments in our lives that we cannot explain? No matter what the deist believes or what the atheist does not believe, God is constantly watching for ways to be involved in our lives. Those who follow the desires of their own souls are subject to the dictates of darkness. They live by the rules of darkness, whether they believe them, recognize them, or care to admit them. They've chosen to live by the laws imposed on them by the ruler of darkness, Satan. Those who have chosen to allow themselves to be unshackled from darkness and be born into the kingdom of God are no longer subjected to the laws of darkness but to the laws of the Creator. And as the Creator, God will always take action against Satan's plans, especially in the lives of those who follow him and no longer live under the dictates of the tyrant. The evidence of God's influence in our lives comes through miraculous incidences that radiate the essence of the divine. They are beyond description. There's a paradox in the notion of whether we can know God exists, and the paradox is in part, you can't know God, and so can you know that something exists that you can't understand? And the answer is, well, that maybe that's why you only see God's back in some real sense, right? You, you get hints. And, and, and maybe you get hints if you open yourself up in the right way. And one of the ways you open yourself up in the right way is not to ask for what you want in the God is a celestial butler manner, but the, the, to ask how it is that you could transform yourself so that you could be a b better agent of the divine will or something right. like that. And then that, what do you is, find when you do that? When you right, embrace right. responsibility, what you find is meaning which is a route to the divine. Well, the secularists yes. would say, well, you, without God, you can still find meaning in service to others. And I would say, yes, that's true. But the reason you find meaning in the service to others is because that's one step on the ladder to the divine. Well, Nietzsche said, God is dead. And what's going to happen? Nihilism. Divine intervention happens in situations that have to do with extreme life changes. It also happens when you meet your spouse or someone almost dies, or it happens in a moment of crisis. Divine intervention also occurs when we're thinking about someone and they call us out of nowhere. All of these and far more are given by God for a specific moment when lives will be changed. They form testimonies that encourage others concerning the greatness of God. It happens most often when we simply say yes to God. But how involved is God in our lives? Does he actually notice every sparrow that falls? Or did he create the earth and all that exists on it, only to leave it in our hands and periodically return to check on how we're doing? Does God actually intervene? Are there depths or levels to this intervention? Or does intervention only take place at the angelic level, such as the time when God sent his angel to destroy 185,000 men of Syria to save Hezekiah? Or can humans have some involvement, such as a time when Aaron and her held up the arms of Moses, and as long as his arms were up, they won. When his arms were down, the Hebrew army would lose. Someone asked me at a university one day, can you prove God exists? And I answered no. I cannot put God in a test tube. I cannot put God in a laboratory and say, here's God. How do I know that God exists? All the evidence seems to indicate that he does. I look up in the starry sky and I say, there must be a God. I look at the beautiful nature round about me and I say, there must be a God. I see the birth of a baby. I watched that. I knew that there had to be a God.
If you stop to think about it, are we actually asking God to intervene in something every time we pray? Shouldn't that be considered divine intervention? Less noticeable might be how life could have drastically changed had you gone to the game with your friend and taken your normal route home, but you didn't. Whatever the reason, there are many monumental or abnormal times when lives suddenly change. The question is, how much was God involved in it? The reality is that on many occasions, we might not notice God was involved at all. On other occasions, we can't stop giving God thanks for what he did. God does act in mysterious ways. After all, isn't every act of God as well as every miracle part of the mystery of divine intervention? Throughout the Bible, especially the New Testament, we find many reasons why God intervened in the lives of people by performing miracles, signs, and wonders. A few of those reasons have been to validate the divine commission given to the disciples or to verify that the Holy Spirit has been given to give power to men. To prove that Jesus is the Messiah and that God is greater than those who defy his commands. The very fact that, while we were yet sinners, God sent his Son to die for us is divine intervention at the highest level. Nations are changed. Bloodlines come into relationship with a God they once were estranged from, and children are born who become great men and women of God and, in turn, change the lives of others. The more you follow the teachings of the Bible, the more often divine intervention will play a part in your daily life. Deep in your heart you have a conscience, and your conscience tells you there must be a God. This is where the first level of divine intervention takes place in our lives. This is a more common intervention because more people have this level of experience than others. Contrary to popular belief, there are some instances where God acts on behalf of someone who is not in a relationship with him. This usually happens in order to help the person reach the purpose they were created for and shift the course of their lives. This divine shift will allow them to embark on a journey to become sons or daughters of his kingdom. Those of us who have a servant's heart seem to experience higher levels of divine intervention than others. It makes no difference if they are a mother at home with their children, a private in the army, or the president of a country. The servant's heart seems to attract the attention of heaven more often. We need to recognize that this divine intervention happens for a purpose much larger than ours. When we grasp this realization, we will enter the next era of our lives. And if we come into agreement with what God has for us, doors of opportunity seem to open at a rate far faster than they had before. Or we might simply have eyes to see God's provision for the first time. As believers, we enter into a greater understanding that everything that happens is a part of God's master plan, and our lives are no longer our own. When believers realize this, there's a shift in identity that takes place. They see themselves as having a destiny or a part to play. A purpose for God, and that part is to make a difference in the lives of others. Ultimately, we have been given the Great Commission seen in Matthew chapter 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. And while we are making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything Jesus has commanded us to do, he will be with us always, intervening and working all things for our good until the very end of the age. So this is my conclusion. God clearly stated that he would honor the people that honor him. God's honor comes in many ways, but whatever the form it takes, the beneficiary's life must change for the better. In Malachi 3 verses 16 to 17, the Bible makes a case for the people that serve God. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. The people that fear the Lord are his children. Their names are written in the book of remembrance. 
To such people, God will always give protection because they are obedient to his word to serve him according to the divine will. God demands honor from his children. He also wants unconditional obedience to his words. I, your, your, your question, where did God come from, is assuming a limited God. And that's your problem. The God that I worship is not limited by time, space, or matter. If I could fit the infinite God in my three-pound brain, he would not be worth worshiping, that's for certain.